Welcome everyone to the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. And this is Chris in South London. And it's our first official episode. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray! Our second take of our first official episode. <laughs> All right. In that yes. in that podcast tradition, uh, we are. Yes. In that, uh, I was doing the recording. However, I managed to capture um, uh, your dulcet tones, Matt, but not mine. So, yep. yay! Well done, me. Darn, we have to talk about Doctor Who some more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What book are we doing? This month, we're doing Engines of War by George Mann. It's uh, unfortunately a little bit timely in that John Hurt has passed away but uh it's the first and only war doctor book that we uh that we have uh and it's um it's George Mann's uh second of two Doctor Who novels um and the first is uh, Paradox Lost featuring the 11th Doctor Amy and Rory uh, which I can't say I've, uh, I've I've had the pleasure of reading and he's also done a companion chronicle for Big Finish which was the, um, the Piralis effect. But neither of those works I've, I've encountered before. But... And the uh, the War Doctor appears in uh, a series of big finish audios. John Hurt reprises his role, the uh, final one, the final box set just came out this week or last week from Big Finish. And then there was also a fan collection of short stories, some of which were by um, big name authors. Uh, mm-hmm. I think... George Mann may have even contributed a short story to that collection mm. uh, called Seasons of War, which was okay. a charity anthology. And then a, he also appeared in the graphic novels, right? Is that um, from, from what I understand? I, I can't say I've read. So this is the this is the only time that I've encountered the War Doctor outside of um, what we've seen on TV. Um, how did you uh, read the story? Did you get the the hardcover or? I I had it on Kindle. Yeah. How, how was that for you? Yeah, it's all right. I I quite like reading books on Kindle. It doesn't take up space. Um, so uh, yeah. I uh, listened to the audio narration by Nick Briggs, which you'll be hearing a little bit of later on uh, in the podcast. Uh, the original Doctor Who Book Club podcast, which we should probably mention. Uh, mm. If listeners want to go back and hear Eric and Sean cover 60 different books across mm. five years from uh, some of the earlier Doctor Who ranges, uh, those podcasts are still up and I uh, encourage you to, to listen mm. to those if you haven't uh, all, already and have come over from that, that show. And there's some great interviews in there as well with the likes of, um, of uh, Robert Smith with a question mark and, uh, and, and, and Tadda Folk, uh, so not the bloke from The Cure. Alas, uh, so, so, so uh, I, I suspect that the cure might be Doctor Who fans. They could have give that general vibe. Shall we go ahead and get into the the plot summary yeah. and then? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. All right. The book we should mention is structured in three parts. Uh, mm-hmm. Part one is called Moldox. Part two, uh, spoilers, is called Gallifrey. And part, part three is called Into the Eye. When I when I read books, I, I tend to, to do a little bit of self-spoiling in that I have to know how the book is structured, you know, how many, if it's in parts or chapters and how that's how that's going to play out. So okay. so part one, Moldox. So we begin on the planet Moldox, which is a, an area of space dominated by this ghostly space structure, which is known as the Tantalus Eye. We may be hearing more from this as, as the book progresses. Yeah, it's one of 12 planets that's orbiting this eye. And it uh, remind that reminded me a little bit of uh, the Impossible Planet and uh, the yeah. Satan Pit, where you have a a planet orbiting a like a non-star sort of structure uh, anomaly in this case. Yeah, it's uh, been home to a human colony uh, that's that's now been invaded by the Daleks, and so we begin uh, on page one with a whole host of Dalek action, which I just with no fault of the book whatsoever, but uh, being a because I've spent quite a lot of time reading the new adventures, I, I I always find it sort of slightly surprising to see the Daleks being referenced directly rather than by illusion. But uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, there's a space battle happening, and we get to see the Doctor mm. kind of in command, leading an an assault. And we've we, got we've... the Battle Tardises all kind of attacking a Dalek fleet, and there's some very kind of cool ramming actions as the kind of TARDIS rams its way through these Dalek sources. And it's fair to say that the TARDISes are used very physically in this book, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the 
cool images that George Mann kind of evoked on the page. Uh, a few of the TARDISes get hit and explode, but it's a mm -hmm. matter of their contents kind of unfolding into three-dimensional space. So he paints this image of almost like a flower blossoming as, as these TARDISes are uh, meeting their untimely end. Yeah, he, he's, yeah, it's certainly, it's a very cool and interesting me um, metaphor, image, uh, that I don't think that I've seen before on a TV show, and I don't remember um, reading it in the books either, but I, I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's happening above the planet. We cut to the planet below, uh, Moldox, and we see Cinder and uh, one of her compatriots in the resistance against the Daleks being, I guess, ambushed by four Scarrow degradations, which is uh, one of the types of things from the Time War that the Tenth Doctor mentions in the End of Time, along with like the Nightmare Child and a whole host of other <laughs> things from Russell T. Davies' imagination. <laughs> <laughs> About, about what's in the Time War, but we see these Scarrow degradations, and mm. uh, the special weapons Dalek that we've seen before in Remembrance of the Daleks could almost be considered one of those. It's a it's like a mutated mm. Dalek with a different casing, one that looks like the special weapons Dalek, which is a temporal weapon Dalek, and we see it use its uh, weapon in, mm. in a moment, and then uh, yeah. so the other ones are like a glider and uh, mm -hmm. like a spider-like Dalek, which seemed to be mm. the uh, in the 90s the... The design <laughs> yes yeah when yeah. when there were so many efforts to try to kind of bring the show back it seemed that everybody wanted to move away from the pepper pot design and uh, have spidery daleks uh and uh, I, I remember reading an interview with russell t davies and oh i've forgotten the name anyway another, another author who uh were having a chat in the fitzroy uh, tavern uh, which is a a pub in London where quite a few of the Doctor Who folk hang out and uh, they and Russell T Davis apparently was was quite insistent yeah I bring the Daleks back and they're proper uh, so uh, yeah uh, and some of the Daleks as well we've got um, the transparent Daleks which uh, are sort of very reminiscent of uh, the ones from Revelation of the Daleks. Cinder's uh, companion or fellow soldier gets mm. hit by a weapon from which is the from one of these temporal weapons Daleks and it has the effect of erasing him from history and Cinder loses begins to lose her memory of him and while that's happening and the Daleks are sort of bearing down on her that's when uh, from above the TARDIS <laughs> crashes <laughs> and we have a yeah. first meeting of uh, Cinder and, and the Doctor. Um, it's quite a cool scene because you've got uh, some Cinder hearing noises from uh, this blue box which is sort of lying on its side and eventually we get kind of uh, you know, its occupant climbing out and she has to kind of flee inside because there's still some kind of Daleks going around sort of shooting things and doing dalek -y stuff and as she kind of goes inside uh, we have our kind of typical variation on it's bigger on the inside and it's, uh, she's saying it's the right way up or words to that effect um, which I thought was quite uh, yeah that's, 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 that's quite tough. I mean it's, it's a long running gag it's a, but it's a good gag and it works yeah, it reminded me of the scene from uh, The Eleventh Hour where Amelia Pond tosses the doctor the, the rope and it's, it's yeah. climbs, it climbs out of it. Uh, and when Cinder actually kind of gets inside, she realises this is a TARDIS and, yeah, this chap's probably a Time Lord. And uh, and she then... It, it was made quite clear that she's a little bit anti-Time Lord, I would say. Or at least certainly she's heard bad things. Yeah, her reaction to the Doctor reminded me a lot of Cass from The Night of the Doctor and how she mm. reacted to uh, the Eighth Doctor, uh, Paul McGann, when when she she first met him. So the Doctor and Cinder dematerialize. Uh, we should mention that Cinder's carrying a Dalek gun that's mm. f functional, although the Doctor thinks that the the power pack has been drained, but that's not the not the case. So the TARDIS is uh, obviously taking a bit of a battering from um, from from the Daleks, and it's kind of needing to rest for a bit. And uh, the the Doctor and Cinder have a conversation about kind of what the Daleks are up to, and Cinder says that the Daleks have been taking lots of prisoners, which seems a bit unusual um, <laughs> given the usual modus operandi. They decide to kind of head off to uh, the nearest city, um, this place called Andor, which is apparently where the Daleks are keeping quite a few of their prisoners because the Doctor is very curious as to what's going on. 
and we also get a scene of uh, the former mm. governor of Moldox, uh, who had worked with the Daleks during the occupation. Uh, she gets brought in, and the weapon that uh, obliterated uh, Cinder's uh, companion also is used on her, and mm. I think really just to show and the audience how it works. And she's also erased from uh, from history, so yeah, kind of a, a one off little scene there's no mention even of her absence later on everyone, uh, everyone forgot about her <laughs> yes yes well she was but well, she was a collaborator so uh, and, and also i think it's fair to say that the folk that we're encountering are fairly kind of ground level we don't see any kind of like real high ups in the resistance but... so when the doctor and cinder are back at the the resistance camp the doctor sees the person who uh it was at finch the the guy who was the other soldier. finch Finch is already, yeah, um, they encounter Coin, who, who's as a, just a sort of battle-hardened soldier, and his recollection is that Cinder had gone off on her own, and uh, gives her a bit of a dressing down. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry I, meant, I meant Finch's bed, bedding. Or... Yes, yeah, 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 they, they, so they find kind of Finch's sort of like, yeah, his stuff, uh, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so it's interesting how this, this kind of wiping you from the time stream works. You, your memory gets removed from people, but sort of stuff that you've done or bought seems, seems to be around, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it's like the, the <laughs> physical evidence of your existence is still around, even though the memory of you isn't, which is yeah. Yeah, strange. So ha- having kind of gambled their provisions, they kind of head on off to uh, Andor, uh, and uh, Andor uh, is quite a sort of a multicultural place. So they talk about there being kind of churches, mosques, skyscrapers, all linked by these walkways. And uh, the uh, Dalek domes are sort of centered around this kind of old school. So we get a bit of sort of wandering around deserted streets, and, and uh, then we, we find uh, our heroes stumble across um, some Daleks who uh, are about to get ready to execute some prisoners. And uh, lo and behold, said prisoners kind of get wiped from the time stream as if they were no business you know, way to finish. Yeah, and the, the doctor witnesses it, but he's able to retain his memory. But Cinder is thinking like it was, I don't remember the number, but it was like a group of ten, four were erased. And then she said, oh, it's just a group of six. And he's in the doc, no, there used to be ten. And so that, that's kind of tipping the doctor off that there's, there's something weird going on here. So they then have a little bit of a debate as to how they're going to get into um, in, in, into the, the Dalek sources, and the Doctor decides to just kind of go and use the front door, which is <laughs> rather Doctory. And uh, so they they kind of wander up a side ramp, and we then discover there's they encounter a closed door, and uh, which uh, Cinder sort of can't open at first, but the doctor sort of says, just basically kind of walk up sort of arrogantly and sort of in a determined way, and lo and behold, it opens, uh, which is a nice insight into the, kind of the Dalek mindset. And so whilst we're wandering around in the saucer, um, they uh, stumble upon a whole room of humans that are being uh, mutated into kind of Daleks, sort of like but within Dalek casings. Uh, and uh, again, it's a little bit like Revelation. I think it's fair to say there's quite a few nods back to uh, classic Doctor Who stories uh, in this book. And, and new series as well. You get <laughs> yeah, you get true. human Dalek hybrids in a number of different stories. Yes. One yeah. one set in New York City, <laughs> <laughs> and of course the the one with uh, the reality TV shows and the Daleks uh, as yes. humans yeah. and using yeah. their that's parts true. there that's too. True. And that's that's after they walk they come across a. Uh, a screen that's been left on where they they learn the whole Dalek plan about how they're going to be harnessing the the Tantalus eye and and the power to to create a large scale version of the the temporal cannon which they intend to use on if at first the systems in the Tantalus eye but eventually I think their goal is to use it against Gallifrey. Uh, it, it, it's fair to say the Dalek security protocol seems to be a little bit shoddy. <laughs> They're leaving this kind of this this top secret information on for anybody that wants into the room to see. Uh, and also there's a reference that because the doctor sort of says that they're using the outer corridors to wander around because the Daleks are in the inner corridors. But yeah, I I wonder what they're up to. I mean, surely there should be a Dalek watching a security cam or something, or maybe 
they're so confident that nobody would be sneaking in. Maybe, maybe that's the line. I don't know. But then the uh, Daleks do eventually discover them, right? After the... Yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah, 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 they do, they do. Um, after we've found a kind of like an autopsy room where we see the Daleks are doing some lovely experiments upon their own degradations, we then move across a walkway into another saucer, uh, and still no Daleks, um, but we discover there's a hatchery for some new carlets and uh, have the Doctor kind of uh, musing about, uh, yeah, he, he starts thinking about Genesis of the Daleks and, um, and you know, do I have to write the scene as to sort of whether or not he should kill um, uh, the Khaleds. And so he, he kind of feels that last time round he might have made the wrong decision. One of uh, several re- references to classic series that George made. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. In in the story, yeah. So they they go they cross into the other saucer. They find yeah. the the hatchery, and it's mm-hmm. I think it's at that point that uh, they get discovered by some Daleks finally. Yes, yes. Well, after they've gone into a store cupboard uh, where they <laughs> where they pick up some some, some Dalek weapons uh, because. Uh, you need to store them in the store cupboard. It reminds me, possibly, maybe I'm being a bit harsh, but it reminds me of, um, is it the Ark that has the security kitchen in it? Yeah, I am being a bit harsh. I'm being a bit mean. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, so, when, when Doctor Who sometimes kind of goes to very specific things, like like store cupboards, I do find quite bizarre. Uh, but, yeah, so they pick up a time cannon there, and which is very handy because when the Dalek appears, sort of, um, about a page or so later, they um, they try it on the Dalek and, and realise it doesn't work on them. But fortunately, Cinder's um, sort of Dalek ray gun does, and so we have quite a bit of sort of running, shooting, escaping, and all that malarkey to get back into uh, the courtyard. And then they remember that there's a whole host of uh, prisoners that um, um, that they've seen. You know, the folk that are being kind of yeah, where are the prisoners from? Do, do we see the prisoners? The other prisoners start to revolt, and then they, uh, yeah. they, they're they they're in the process of tr- they're trying to overpower uh, the, the Daleks, but we don't yeah. really find out whether or not they succeed or not. No. The, the Doctor and Cinder <laughs> dash off to the TARDIS. And, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, leave them to it. Yeah. Yes, yes I, I think it's fair to say that, that this War Doctor, he's worked... Well, is he re- he's realized what the scale of the problem is uh, and, and and he's being possibly maybe a little bit sort of maybe a little bit pragmatic I mean whilst he did rescue the prisoners he did kind of leave them to an extent to their fate uh, but we get that lovely little uh, scene where where he sort of says that uh, you know, humanity can kind of achieve great things um, I'm paraphrasing wildly um, you know, when, when you've got this ginormous melee between um, you know, between the humans and the Daleks, so yeah, it's, it's quite a cool scene. We get a final scene which kind of acts as the cliffhanger if you want to look at it as yes, yes. Uh, part one, part two, and part three. Yeah, we get a scene with uh, the Daleks' eternity circle, which is a group <laughs> of uh, Daleks, high level managers, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that are uh in in charge and and the, the dalek emperor is there you know they they talk about the weapon is basically ready to use and it's online well they met well they detected the doctor and they realized the doctor's involved they they they're, they're, they say it's too late and they're ready to uh to use it and they also talk about the predator will soon be in mm. possession was a term that the 11th doctor used to refer to himself in uh yes. asylum of the daleks reminded me of uh was it the oncoming storm and there's mm. some other references to the the doctor and some of the the virgin yes. adventures yes uh, kaparak gatri i think is is that i probably mispronounced that horribly but i think that that's what uh, they they would call them in the mccoy era uh and basically you know, one of the Daleks is described as almost chuckling i mean it, it very much yeah, you can imagine there's like a white cat being stroked somewhere out of shot. It is uh, that, that kind of sort of, oh, it's not quite Bond but this, but, uh, but yes, they're, 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 yeah, they are confident, let's put it that way. So then we get to uh, part two, which mm. is called uh, Gallifrey, and we're introduced to uh, <laughs> Carlax, who's yes. monitoring several different Dalek kind of battles that are happening, mm. Time Lord Dalek battles that are happening throughout time and space. And he's uh, summoned by the Castellan, and 
the yeah. day of meet and all of a sudden alarms start going off and <laughs> the ship's yes. approaching and they're they're worried that it's you know some sort of trojan horse from the daleks um but it turns out to be the doctor yes yes and so when the 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 blue police box arrives uh Carlux rather wonderfully says oh it's him and so uh, cinder uh while she's delighted to finally kind of get off um Maldox, uh she really uh, isn't enamored with the prospect of uh, meeting the other time lords who uh, she thinks will be kind of condescending and snooty and uh, yeah she will not be disappointed it's fair to say and, and uh, after a some back and forth then the doctor demands an audience with rassilon and carlax takes him to uh to the war room which we mm. first see in the 50th anniversary special and that's the uh mm. kind of the the ch- the council chamber in the basement where <laughs> yes where the real yeah. decisions are made while the the high council meets upstairs in the uh, mm. you know well while, while the end of time is taking place in another yeah. room <laughs> yes and uh, Cinder described it as being understated, uh, which I don't know whether that was kind of a, a little bit of a pop at the productive values of the 50s. Yeah, I don't know, is it is it understated? Because when, when you look at sort of photos of these kind of real life uh, in the White House, um, um, sort of when there was a footage of kind of Obama watching uh, various missions and things, uh, I don't know whether that's technically a war room, but uh, that looked like just a regular uh, sort of like office room with like a giant screen on so uh, maybe cinder has some uh, very high standards uh, but uh, yeah in the war room we meet rassilon and yeah. it's timothy dalton it's, it's a james <laughs> <laughs> and he's uh, uh it, it is wearing his uh glove his yes uh which which is kind of a mirror counterpart to what the daleks have developed because it essentially mm. does the same thing it yes. uh, erases you from from the timeline Yes, yes. These comparisons between Time Lords and Daleks are uh, not going to go away. Uh, <laughs> say as we continue, and and then there's a the kind of a reference to uh, the Master having kind of gone off uh, sort of a wall, and uh, the Doctor had been on a mission to try to track him down, and uh, as yet unsuccessful, uh, which kind of made yeah you know, made me wonder as if uh, sort of, you know we were going to see. You know, either Anthony Ainley or Derek Jacobi um, uh, or a snake uh, appear later on. <laughs> yeah, any, any of the above. <laughs> yes. Yeah, when, yes. When, when you said that, I had, I had Derek Jacobi in my mind in terms of yeah. which master I was thinking of from uh, Utopia, but uh, yeah, it could have been any, any of those. Or, or someone else, really. <laughs> and so uh, the Doctor kind of gives Russell a bit of a briefing as to what's been kind of going there, and and, uh, and, and then they're ushered into the High Council Chamber, uh, which you may remember from the Five Doctors. Uh, and we get the kind of the Council gather, and it's made very clear that there is an empty chair with an exquisite carving. I did wonder whether that was going to be the Masters. Or was supposed to be the masters. Yeah, it could it could have been the masters. There, it could have been uh, the woman we see in the end of time, which uh, mm-hmm. Russell T Davies and Julie Gardner uh, refer to as the Doctor's mother. Yeah, She's kind of covering her eyes and almost like a weeping angel mm-hmm. uh, pose. And then, uh, or it could have been even Ro- Romana, I suppose. Yeah, because there's also um, the unnamed young woman with a black bob hair that uh, we see. Um, uh, as being one of the cancer, and I wondered whether that was um, supposed to be a version of Romana. Who, who knows? Because uh, she doesn't appear again. Um, but, we get but, we get we get quite a bit of Romana in uh, the Big Finish Gallifrey series yeah, as it yeah. kind of tiptoes right up to the edge of the time war. We see how Romana escapes E space in the Apocalypse Element, which is one of the very early Big Finish stories. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If you consider Big Finish canon, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which which I do, I guess, yeah, yeah, <laughs> unless it's contradicted by something. Else. Yes, <laughs> oh, canon. That's so... a whole that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. Well, I, I, I think if if you try and figure out even just within the TV show, if you try and make it kind of consistent in your head, you'll go mad. Uh, if you just think about Atlantis and the various different versions of Atlantis, you see. So uh, yeah. Just enjoy it as a story. Um, what was the line that uh, Alan Moore said about um, at the start of um, uh, 
whatever happened to Superman, which is his um, his thing, his farewell to the um, to the original version of Superman Before Crisis, and and he sort of says that this is an imaginary story, but aren't they all? Um, yeah, and it r- reminds me a little bit of the the lyric mm-hmm. from the uh, Mystery Science Theater three thousand opening theme <laughs> where they say. It's it's just a show. You should really just relax. Which is yes, in reference yes. uh, in how the main character eats and breathes in space. So yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, just enjoy. Yeah. Uh, the council uh, now kind of getting into a full on row with the doctor, um, as always seems to be the case with every rock up on Gallifrey, and they start to discuss various strategies and weapons that they can use, including the moment which uh, you may remember from Dave the Doctor, and uh, also something called. The tier of um, Aisha, Isha. Aisha, I think is how. Uh, Aisha. Aisha. I think that's how Nick Briggs pronounced it, at least in the in the audio narration. And they make reference to uh, all these weapons being in. I think they call it the Omega Arsenal, which uh, reference to Omega from uh, the Three Doctors. And... <laughs> who, who, who doesn't rock up? I must say, I was always half expecting him at one point. <laughs> um, Every, everyone, everyone else is in this book. So. <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah, so the proposal is to fire the uh, the tear into the Tantalus eye, uh, which will destroy the Daleks, but it will also destroy the entire system. So uh, yeah, collateral damage somewhat. And uh, yeah, the Doctor is very much against this idea, as is Cinder. And uh, Rassilon, um starts to get a little bit prickly about the, the Doctor's human pet. And we basically, uh, whilst they're waiting for Rassilon to make his his final decision they kind of look across uh, the city and you can basically hear the Murray Gold music in your ears. Um, and we have these memory lanterns that are being released. And so that's because um, a lot of the people of Gallifrey fear that they're about to die. They're releasing their memories so that these can live on even if they die, uh, which is a lovely romantic image uh, that's somewhat crushed by the Doctor, uh, saying that the memories will break up in the time winds. Um, and so it's all a bit pointless. Yeah, um, it reminded me of like a uh, Japanese lantern lighting ceremony mm. or uh, the white boxes that were seen in The Doctor's Wife and uh, The War Games. Was it the memory cubes? Uh, yeah. the similar sort of... It's a beautiful image. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so it kind of breaks up um, all, all of the kind of like the political rowing. Um, for which we have some more. Because uh, uh, <laughs> they... The doctor and Cinder get summoned to an audience of Rassilon, who says, "Yeah, I'm going to use the tear." And uh, the the doctor compares Rassilon to basically being close to a Dalek, and uh, Rassilon then lets slip that there's a possibility engine he has uh, that lets him see possible futures, and that's going to be the final, final, final arbiter. And that's where the doctor starts kind of following <laughs> Rassilon. Yeah, he observes him using. Uh, the harp from that we had seen previously in the five doctors uh waits a bit and then follows him and the teleport is set for the uh the tower and yeah there we see uh Rassilon, uh and the doctor's kind of watching in the shadows of the catacombs yes. yeah. Uh, yeah we we see uh barusa come up out of the the altar that he was um last seen kind of turned into a, a stone face Mm-hmm. on which which I, as an aside i wonder if they got that technology from the weeping angels now that I... <laughs> I In, interesting yeah 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 barusa the possibility engine who he's kind of is uh, kind of strapped to a gurney i'm thinking like almost like a clockwork orange sort of imagery and he's aura. being forced to continually regenerate um and so which is is quite horrific as uh because certainly the books have made it very clear over the years that uh, regeneration is not a piece of cake. It's very, very painful and a traumatic experience. And uh, yeah, he, he, he does appear to be in agony. And, uh, and he confirms what the, what the doctor is saying about the Daleks is right. And uh, then rather charitably, he mentions, oh, the doctor's in the room with us, um, which is lovely of him. Um, yeah. So there's another row between the doctor and Russell. Um, and uh, Russell is again compared to a Dalek. Uh, and uh, Russell decides to ask Barusa about what actually will happen if the tear is used. 
And he says that the eye will close, the Daleks will fall, but the era of the Time Lords will still come to an end. Uh, so, but Rasson decides, yeah, he's got to use the tear. Marusa says there, I mean, still could come true. Mm. Or does come true in, in terms of yeah. Gallifrey getting locked into, uh, you know, the events of the 50th. I mean, that all yeah. still kind of plays out as, as, yeah. he, as he predicts there. Yeah, he's not wrong. So while well, all this is happening in mm. the Dark Tower, Cinder's left alone on Gallifrey, and mm-hmm. she tries to explore a little bit, and she gets <laughs> <laughs> always a good idea. Always a good idea for a Doctor Who companion to just go for a wonder, because what could go wrong? <laughs> in, in, in this case, <laughs> quite a, a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cinder gets stopped by Carlax, and Carlax repeatedly throughout the story is kind of referred to Cinder as the doctor's pet he doesn't see her yeah. as being with with kind of as like a lesser lower life form almost and he, yeah. he decides well might as well experiment on you yes <laughs> and he yes. takes her to uh to the mind probe <laughs> not the mind probe yeah. yes um, <laughs> five doctors fans may remember it <laughs> yes uh and so her memories kind of come flooding back which includes um, the Daleks kind of attacking her family in the kitchen. And she, you know, she basically has no idea whether her relatives survived because she just had to run. And uh, we see various other stages in her life, um, including um, sort of uh, her first kiss uh, with a uh, with a female soldier. It was almost unremarkable in that it was yeah. just presented as a uh, one of one of many images and. Uh... Nice too that the, this is yet another uh, companion who falls on the LGBT uh, mm. Q spectrum. Mm. Uh, we've had uh, let's see Captain Jack, Captain Jack, and Sam from was she... uh, Izzy, 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 Izzy from the Eighth Doctor comics, and and arguably Clara. Certainly, well, she, she she implies that she and Jane Austen are very close friends, <laughs> and also Chris Fay from uh... yeah. The new, the new adventures, adventures. Yes, from um, the from the wilderness years, or as Paul Cornell likes to call them, uh, the theme park years, yes. given the the amount of output during yeah. that time. Yeah, certainly we had more Doctor Who in the wilderness years than we had last year, but that's another matter. Uh, and she then eventually remembers Finch, uh, who was her compatriot, who who was killed right at the start of the book. Uh, when it's switched off, Carlux, because he's he's a nasty piece of work, expresses pity that uh, that Cinder's managed to survive. Cinder says that the Doctor will kill him for this, and then Carlux sneers and says that the Doctor doesn't like to get his hands dirty. Carlux is a piece of work. So next up, the Doctor and Rassilon arrive back in the chamber um, with Rassilon and sort of uh, say, yeah, 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 I'm definitely going to use the tear. And then the doctor realizes that Cinder's kind of gone missing, uh, and uh, comes back and uh, has a little bit of an argument with Carla. And then the the Kaslan plays the harp in the chamber and uh, and reveals that Cinder's been kept in what seems to be kind of Barusa's old hidey hole uh, from the Five Doctors. Yeah, um, the time scoop room, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and and we also you know, somebody does just shout the mind probe. Uh, <laughs> How how much if you haven't seen the Five Doctors? If you were a a, a new series fan, how much of this uh, you'd be kind of getting? But then again, I think the Five Doctors is one of those classic Doctor Who stories that probably a lot of people have seen because it's it's a nice kind of convenient sort of entry point. I had mentioned in our episode zero that I had come in with the TV movie, so for me to go back and catch up on all of Classic Who, it wasn't. It wasn't airing like on PBS uh, locally in, okay. uh, in the Twin Cities at the time, mm. so I, I had to catch up on, on VHS, and so one of the first ones I bought was The Five Doctors, because mm. I thought, well, there's five of them in it. Yeah, because yeah, it was the second story I ever saw. Uh, I've seen it on PBS in D.C. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah, they, they, they were doing a fundraising night, which uh, if you re- read sort of Doctor Who magazine in the 80s, you kind of get the impression that every night is a fundraising night on uh, on PBS stations. Uh, but uh, yeah, They have quite a few yeah. drives throughout the year. Yes, 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 and possibly more so at the moment. Yeah. So the, um, the R- Rassilon ends up uh, locking Cinder and the Doctor in a cell. And then pounding the TARDIS. And uh, in the cell that they wake up in, uh, or the Cinder wakes up in, it's kind of made clear, it's very kind of medieval, there's no pipes, it's just stone walls and a slab. Yeah, and the Doctor basically has kind of 
almost given up at this point because apparently you know his sonic screwdriver won't work on the door and uh, and and also cinder sort of says nice place you've got here which makes me think of um uh, the line that the 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 various doctors kind of use at each other when they uh, uh, they, they see the others tardis sort of particularly day of the doctor uh, as well as in the three doctors does it get used in the five doctors i can't remember so, but Cinder um, realises that rather fortuitously she had a bracelet on her that I don't remember being mentioned before and that the guards hadn't removed it. So she um, she uses it to pick the lock and uh, somewhat surprises the doctor. So um, they go out and, 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 and they're kind of loose in... Um, in, in, in the kind of the tunnels yep. and then the doctor uses his sonic screwdriver as a homing beacon to try and find the TARDIS and that leads them yes. to the almost like a it reminded me of the scene from the doctor's wife with all the different TARDIS pieces on the uh, home planet or yeah home. It reminded me of that kind of like an elephant's graveyard yeah uh, and so yeah because you see one that's been kind of cracked open there's one disguised as a dalek saucer there's a galleon there's a torpedo and uh, we then have a little bit of a shootout as uh, kind of like the guards come in the uh, the doctor and cinder manage to kind of find their way to the tardis and as they're trying to kind of take off uh, the castellan appears uh, on the monitor to basically say yeah no um, he, um you know we're, we're not letting you leave but yeah, so the doctor appeals to the Castellan's conscience and uh, and convinces him that he doesn't want to uh, have the kind of the fact that the tear is used as being kind of his responsibility. So the Castellan decides to let them leave. When I was thinking of the Castellan in this and mm. some of the other scenes, what was originally coming to mind for me was the guy from the the fiftieth anniversary special. Yeah. Yeah. Later regenerates in um I think Hellbent, but that's a different character, right? That's that's um the general. Is that? Yeah, because I think he's a general. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I I I was just trapped with uh, the Castellan from the Five Doctors, who uh, is definitely killed at the end of the. Um, anyway, we know the type. So so Carlax um uh, transmits to the Tower of Rassilon to uh, break the news himself uh, to Rassilon about what the, you know, the fact that the Doctor managed to escape. And, uh, and and he also encounters Barusa. Uh, this still doesn't quite put him off uh, the idea of uh, working for Rassilon. And almost as like a punishment, uh, Rassilon decides to send Carlax uh, after the Doctor, making it clear that it's not worth returning if he kind of comes back either empty-handed or you know, with the Doctor still alive somewhere. Or, or if not, <laughs> don't come back at all. Yeah, because the way this is structured, you we know, works three parts. It did remind me very much of kind of like a um, a three part um, sort of TV story in the, you know, in the modern day, kind of like Utopia, etc. The way that it's been done. Um, yeah, there's, but... there's certainly I think too much action in each part to fit into like a 25 minute story, but a 45 yeah. minute story, like you said. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it fits almost perfectly. All right, so part three, Into the Eye. Mm -hmm. The Doctor and Cinder are in the TARDIS, or uh, the Castellan has allowed them to escape, and mm -hmm. the Doctor finds two tracking devices on yeah. Cinder, which he uh, dismantles, and yeah. Cinder goes and has a little bit of a wander. <laughs> yes, yes, kind of going through the usual kind of odd rooms that you get in the TARDIS and this thing for the jungle and various other kind of crazy stuff. And she comes, this is where she changes into a uh, Greenpeace. Uh, yes. I, I thought might have been left over from Sam, which yeah. was the eighth doctor previously, but uh, you sort of particularly kind of like for a bit of a deep cut. And so it's, like, it's that David Banks. Um, <laughs> which is David Banks um, was the the theatre doctor for about a month or two in the, uh, in the ultimate adventure as yes understudy yeah. earlier on this month I went to my local theatre and uh, and there's a blue plaque on the wall that says that um, because it's where the ultimate adventure started it was where the the first performance was and uh, kind of commemorating John Pertwee oh, uh, that's wonderful which is kind of, yeah that was kind of cool yeah it was uh, utterly unexpected um, but so, yeah, it's basically said like John Pertwee performed here. I thought you could probably do that with most theatres in London, but uh, kind of, the TARDIS at the moment is is it's in the kind of the time vortex, and uh, so the Doctor decides to kind of go to um, the Tantalus spiral, um, and 
and as soon as they emerge from the vortex, uh, they come under attack from uh, some battle TARDISes. Uh, and uh, this leads the Doctor to conclude that there's got to be another tracking device, which is probably Cinder. And we then realise that uh, Carlax is uh, listening into the TARDIS in <laughs> a way that time lords often seem to do. Uh, and yeah, the scene from... Uh... The, the Stephen Moffat, uh, the curse of the fatal death. <laughs> yes. yeah. In terms of listening in. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it does make me wonder just how. I, I, I don't think that the book is tongue in cheek, but I, I, I do wonder whether sort of some of these things are, are, are meant to be kind of enjoyed in a um, sort of. Uh, not really meta level, but you know. Uh, not, not, not quite a panto vibe, but I, yeah. I, I do get. Uh, like an undercurrent of like that this is a, a classic series story almost <laughs> yes, more so than, yeah. a, than a new series story and then the the battle tardis is attack mm. and with time torpedoes which uh create almost like a stasis bubble mm. around the uh around the tardis and then at the same time that that happens Dalek stealth ships show up conveniently <laughs> picking that as an opportune time to strike yeah. And they start attacking all the TARDISes. Yes, and you have some more scenes of the kind of the contents of the TARDISes unfolding as they're blown up, uh, which is, you know, is, is pretty cool as an image. Uh, and uh, then the Doctor lets slip that uh, actually the time torpedo hadn't really affected the TARDIS. He was just doing it as a bit of a ruse. Um, and as they're about to flee, he sort of sees um, someone floating around in the console room ruins. Uh, and uh, decides to kind of go and rescue the survivor, and they sort of materialize around it. And it turns out, yay, it's Carlax. Da da da. They pick him up and take him into the zero room to regenerate. The doctor's not <laughs> sure if uh, if the yes. ne- if the next Carlax will be will be better, and yes. so he yeah. wants to give him a chance, which is a, yeah. a nice doctor sentiment yeah. to express. But he, he does also explain to Cinder that the Zero Room is essential in the regeneration process. And I was like, apart from in Castro Valva, it's not really. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe but it's... Still, maybe I, it was a white lie. I, I, I wonder, too, if, if the... Because didn't they get him in there before he started regenerating? So I wonder if you, uh, if you start oh, regenerating yeah. in the Zero Room, if that lessens the effects of any post-regenerative... <laughs> Yes, stress or anything. I wonder. That makes you less of a, a yeah, a, a paper. Car axis. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, we complete that out. So um, th- there's now a bit of a, a full-on conflict between the um, a Time Lord flotilla and and Daleks, and uh, the Doctor is uh, able <laughs> conveniently to realise which of the Tardises um, contains uh, the tear and materialises uh, within that that TARDIS, which is uh, run by a, um, a, a commander, Parthius. And uh, uh, Parthius says TARDIS has a bridge that feels very Star Trek. And uh, Parthius is also, he's described in such a way that I can only picture Brian Blessed. They, they then have um, a little bit of a, um, a fight, the Doctor and Parthius, because uh, I mean, it's fair to say the War Doctor, he is He's quite a scrappy, argumentative doctor. Um, yeah, he's he's very physical. It rem- yeah. reminded me a lot of the third doctor in his Venusian Nikito. But I mean, this this is a kind of a desperate man who you know uh, have been kind of forced to do sort of desperate things that don't come naturally to him. And they have to. And the I don't know if it, is it the the tear is primed and it it's mm. ready to go or, or or why they have to use why they have to deploy it, but the doctor ends up jumping forward to mm. the end of the the end of the universe really yes yeah um, which is getting a little crowded if you think of the numbers <laughs> <set there. laughs> so 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 pr- presumably while this is happening the 12th doctor and me are watching you know yes. the war doctor launch the tier i think zagreus is happening in another corner yeah. and <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Adams is running a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's somewhat quieter at the Big Bang, uh, but uh, that might change the next book we go for. So, um, so the tear is used, and uh, and yeah, there's a little bit of a debate as to kind of like, well, what are we going to use to stop the Daleks? <laughs> and uh, the Doctor says uh, yeah, he's going to kind of wing it, um, effectively. 
and uh, and and Parfius is uh, he he he, he feels that the Doctor is a good man. He kind of thinks, yeah, you're going to need to leave my ship now. Um, I mean, quite how Parfius is going to kind of write this up in any reports. Parthius orders them to leave. I think he does. He yeah. does. He do, he does. Um, and that's that brings us to our dramatic reading for the month, where hmm. the Doctor and Cinder land on Gallifrey, but not where you might expect. We're going to do something a little different and play a very short excerpt under fair use for review purposes from the BBC audio adaptation of the novel performed by Nicholas Briggs, who also provides the voice of the Daleks. The BBC book's audio narrations, if you've not heard them, feature music and sound effects to help round out the listening experience. The Engines of War audio is available for purchase wherever audiobooks are sold, including on CD, iTunes, and other download services, and may also be available as a streaming selection on Audible. Let's have a listen. The TARDIS materialized on a bluff above a desolate, wild landscape. After a moment, the door opened and Cinder emerged, bracing herself against the sharp bite of the wind. Her hair whipped up into her face, her eyes streamed, and she found herself wrapping her arms around her body, trying to retain the warmth. She heard the doctor close the TARDIS door behind her, and looked round to see him standing there, surveying the moorland below them. As far as the eye could see, fields of straw-like grass and heather, punctuated by the occasional clump of trees, dominated the view. The sky was a crisp, pale blue, shot through with wisps of cloud. "'I thought you said we were going back to Gallifrey,' she said. "'Ah,' replied the doctor. "'Yes, I should explain.' Cinder raised an expectant eyebrow, putting her hands on her hips. Well? This is Gallifrey, he said. At least in a sense. It's a small pocket of Gallifrey and wilderness, cordoned off in a temporal bubble. The Time Lords know it affectionately as the Death Zone, he grinned. Pretty inhospitable place, really, he said. Wonderful, said Cinder. The death zone. She stamped her feet, feeling exposed up there in the hillside. Remind me why we're here again? The death zone used to be the place where unlucky participants were co-opted to play the game of Rassilon, pitted in a life-or-death battle against a variety of alien species, forcibly scooped from their natural habitats, said the doctor. "'ignoring her question. "'And here's me thinking the Time Lords were good guys,' "'said Cinder sarcastically. "'It was a long time ago, back in the first age of Rassilon. "'He built his tomb here.' "'The Doctor turned on the spot, "'pointing to a black spire in the distance, "'jutting from the earth at the foot of a mountain. "'There,' he said. "'The Dark Tower.' "'His tomb?' said Cinder. But he's not dead. I met him, as much as I wish I hadn't. It's complicated, said the doctor. Rassilon is essentially immortal. In ancient times he gave up corporeal form, and for millennia resided here in his tomb, worshipped as a once and future king. He was resurrected back in the early days of the war, however when the Time Lords realized they needed a different sort of leader. I can see it's done them the world of good, said Cinder. Quite, replied the Doctor. He looked downcast. You still haven't answered my question, she said. What question? Why we're here? We're here to commit a jailbreak, said the Doctor. Rassilon has someone... Trapped in the tower. Someone whose help we need. His name is Barusa. We're going to help him to escape. Okay, so the Doctor and Cinder, as we've just heard, have arrived in the Death Zone and they're making their way to the Tower of Rassilon in the distance. And they encounter um, uh, three more Time Lords in a, in a cave, and they're just like Barusa, kind of changing between sort of past and kind of future incarnations. 
uh, and uh, their early experiments of Rassilon. And so Cinder refers to them as the, um, uh, as the interstitials. And they're, um, they seem to be in a constant state of regenerative flux. Yeah. As well. They also got chased by a giant dinosaur, yeah. <laughs> briefly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they yeah. they did they ran into this cave and um, <laughs> there's something else in the cave as well. Yes, yeah, so there there are various kind of cave paintings um, uh, and you've got uh, the doctor next to uh, a woman with blonde hair and a tall red flower uh, that I didn't recognize at the time, but you suggested to me that that's Rose and I think you're right. Yeah, I, yeah. I think whether it's Rose or whether it's the moment coming up or yeah in, yeah in the 50th or if it's a uh, bad yeah. wolf or all of the above but it's uh, yes and yeah. it's meant to be rose but there's some other things mm. on the wall too right there's yeah because we've got um uh, the thin man with long curly hair that's almost certainly got to be uh, um tom maker's doctor and uh, and man of a cape and bouffant white hair running from a silver robot so that's Got to be John Pertwee, say hello to the Rasson robot from the Five Doctors. Um, does make you wonder why um, they were chased by a lizard and not a yeti. The time scale was busy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Picking up all yes. sorts of things. Um, Maybe the yeti have rights issues. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah that, that could be, because this, did this come, no, this came out around the time of the snowmen, or yeah. the end of series seven, where the great intelligence was the villain, so... Maybe, you but know. but they don't use the yeti though, do they? But then they can. Yes. How effective? How scary would the yeti be to a modern audience? There's one very crucial um, painting is um, that of a woman with red hair lying still in the TARDIS, uh, and and Cinder kind of thinks that that might be her. Make their way to the the tower, and they mm-hmm. rescue Barusa. They kind of they're basically carrying him out and almost like a stretcher. Uh, condition and uh, whilst they kind of they carry him out, they see various more interstitials kind of lighting the way to the TARDIS, um, this kind of this orange glow, which is quite um, a sinister but beautiful image. It's one of these things that uh, you know George Mann does occasionally kind of you know, sort of put into the book, the, the, you know, the, these quite striking images. And the TARDIS now kind of leaves the death zone um, with kind of Barusa. In, in tow and they return to the tantalus eye where mm. they see uh this a large cannon being charged up uh, yes death star style yes yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes it is it's, it's it's a wee bit death sorry um the doctor decides to uh, to surrender to the daleks um but that's the only way that he thinks that he can get anywhere near the eye and the Daleks are all for that because they have they have a special p- place prepared for him uh, yes. as they as they referenced earlier the the predator Dalek uh, so imagine like almost like a uh, Davros style casing mm. or where the it opens up and the there's room it's a larger sized Dalek and there's room enough for the, the doctor to sit in it almost like a Pandorica chair um, speaking of Davros where is he in all of this I don't know he was he was resurrected as well, wasn't he? Yeah, it yeah, could have yeah. been at a different point in the time war. Hey ho, um, yeah. So as you said, they intend for the doctor to be kind of placed inside this casing and become the Dalek himself, mm-hmm. and uh, and sort of the doctor and Cinder realise that uh, yeah, this this is it. This is this is journey's end, and uh, and then suddenly the Talus kind of materialises around them. It's being piloted by Carlax. <laughs> the, the, the newly regenerated Carlax, who's had a uh, a change of face. Yes, yes, but not a change of character, and yeah. still determined uh, to uh, to kill the Doctor. It, he 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 brings out a gun and uh, and, and sort of shoots, and Cinder uh, pushes the Doctor out of the way, and she kind of catches um, um, the blow, kind of you know, in its full force, and, and, and is sort of. Yeah, and, and, and is quite seriously wounded, um, and, uh, and and we then have a kind of a you know, a sort of row with the Doctor and Carlax, and the Doctor decides uh, rather wonderfully to dematerialize, but leaving Carlax in front of all the Daleks. Yeah. You, <laughs> Which you, is you, kind you, of the fate he deserves. That reminded me of the scene from Blink when the TARDIS mm. dematerializes around 
uh, Sally Sparrow and yeah. leaving her with the the angels kind of encircling her, but frozen. But in this case, yes. the the Daleks <laughs> start exterminating. <laughs> so, yes. but but yeah, we we do have that scene then in the TARDIS that was depicted on the on the wall where Cinder has taken the or the shot from the gun to save the Doctor, and and we get that image then. So the Doctor is having to kind of he he thinks he might have a plan um, uh, to save to to save her despite the fact that she's died, and and he's. He, he kind of thinks it's it's yeah, it's going to be sort of Barusa is going to do it, um, but so at this point I was kind of having flashbacks to um, to the Doctor Who TV movie, um, which uh, also features a companion lying dead on the TARDIS floor. And I was going back to uh, the Richard Donner Superman film <laughs> at the end, with the uh, uh, where Lois is dead and and kind of tries wants to spin time backwards. When I. I watched that with my wife a few years ago. It was the first time she'd ever seen that movie. And I managed to convince her that, yeah, no, it's a great tragedy. Lois dies. (laughs) (laughs) So so, um, we've we've got the TARDIS that's now kind of flying into uh, into the Tantalus Eye. And the Doctor is is insisting that Barusa makes real um, a kind of a timeline in, uh, uh, in which kind of Cinder would um, would live and, and 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 kind of like the Daleks would all die and but then um, realizes we should mention at this point that Bruce is kind of glowing even more so being so close yeah. to the eye. Um, I was picturing in my mind uh, Rose as kind of bad wolf and that she can see all the different possible futures and yeah. can, can reach into them and actually manipulate them. Whereas before, I think Perusa was just able to to view different realities, and now he's he has the ability to to affect them. Perusa uh, sort of manages to kind of, as you say, Rose style, uh, wipe the Eternity Circle and Dalek fleet and 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 everything kind of uh, out of existence. Um, however, he's not able to bring back Cinder. He he, he kind of vanishes, doesn't he? Kind of burnt up by yeah, uh, yeah, you know, by all of the effort. Poor Cinder is no more. Yeah, and then the Doctor lands on a uh, Moldox and finds the remains of Cinder's family, and it takes Cinder's uh, body as well and has a burial uh, ceremony at at Cinder's old house. He, at the gravesite, he makes uh, he makes one final promise to her that he's gonna end the war, and he utters the uh, the phrase "No more." Yes. <laughs> so, and there we have it. That was yeah. uh, Engines of War. I I think it in terms of setting. I think it it uh, the the references to Rose and the moment and you know the no more. It makes me think that this is placed really at the very tail end of his timeline, mm. almost acting as an immediate prequel to the fiftieth anniversary story. I suppose there it could be moved around a little bit but yeah it, it seems to be tied a lot closer to the the end of the war doctor's life yes yeah it certainly is it's towards the end I mean, there, there is a little bit of of wriggle room for uh if, uh, you know if, if anybody does want to write any more but yeah i i, I would say it's, it's it's towards the end so what did what you, you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> um i i really i really enjoyed this one um I thought it was. Uh, I like. I tend to like continuity heavy books. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not quite this continuity heavy. <laughs> but, uh, I, I appreciate the references and the ones that I don't get. I like to try and look up and see what it is. I might you know might be not catching on to or. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, th- I thought the the representation of the time war was was interesting because it's you think about it you know gosh the great time war and you think all the different ways that could play out and does it does it almost limit one's imagination when you start putting constraints on it um yeah. but i but i feel the the choices that george mann made in this in this book he he did a good job in picking element leaving so much open to, to interpretation still but at least nailing down in this particular section of space in time here's here's what was going on and it, yeah. it leaves the door open for others to contribute to i think yes I mean, and, and he he's adding stuff as well um sort of in, in the continuity because it's not in contrast to uh war of the daleks say um which uh 
tries to tie up quite a few kind of loose threads um and uh, at least here we're adding things we're seeding things we're we're allowing for kind of new stories to be told when and we're not contradicting as far as i can tell you know old you know old stories um so i i think yeah, it, it's done with a, you know, a relatively um sort of deft touch um and certainly i mean the book does rattle on at, you know, at a decent enough pace and uh, and you do get these these wonderful little kind of you know, little vignettes as it were um uh, sort of with you know the memory lanterns and and, and, and such like the dialogue um, we've not really kind of given much of a flavor of the dialogue uh, but it can be kind of quite sort of witty and punchy particularly when the doctor is uh, is he's having his debates with with various time lords there were one or two bits that i kind of found that i had to kind of reread once or twice um sort of uh, in the early stages on Mordox, just to trying to kind of um sort of get the choreography of scenes right in my head uh but uh you know, it was it, it, it was a good read and it was it, it must be quite a challenge writing about a doctor who has only had about sort of 30 minutes screen time or so uh and trying to kind of make a full story out of it uh and and also kind of introducing a you know, a companion he 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 does have a kind of it, it, it's a high difficulty threshold <laughs> for his I, I wonder too um and this might be in the uh, there's a infographic book called Who Graphica that's out. Mm. I wonder if Paul McGann ver- versus John Hurt, who yeah. who's played the Doctor for longer, <laughs> on screen minutes and seconds because it's yes. probably pretty close because because Paul McGann didn't show up until the the last you know not for the first half hour mm. of the TV movie, and you know you've got the short War Doctor clip in uh, Name of the Doctor, and then of course with Paul McGann you've got his his little clip from Night of the Doctor that's too, that's but. That's yeah, yeah, probably pretty close between the two of them. Probably. I mean, I would say, like, when, when the War Doctor first appeared, uh, not in the book, but just generally, um, I, 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 I was a bit like, yeah, about it, because I liked the idea that it was it was uh, Paul McGann's Doctor who um, who ended up fighting the Time War. Um, this guy who started out so full of hope and optimism that he was kind of battered down by the universe. I, I found that a really powerful... And a compelling idea. Well, I think I think yeah, the War Doctor is a very good and very clever addition to the mythos. Don't get me wrong. Um, it just did take a little bit of kind of yeah. getting out from my head cannon. One of the concepts explored in this book is, uh, you know, as, as someone gets erased from the timeline, how your memories change to to keep up with that. It's it's kind of like yeah. that in reverse, yes. where you have to, <laughs> to re re edit your <laughs> what, what you previously thought. Yes. Yeah, you 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 will get a little taste of that, I think, in the. There's an upcoming Big Finish uh, audio that's set with Paul McGann in the Time War leading up to what happens in Night of the Doctor. Uh, yeah. I think that comes out this fall in November okay. 2017. So okay. uh, that might even add a little bit more to the mythos. Yeah. Any other, Anything else you want to say about the book specifically or <laughs> should, should we go well, ahead and rate this one? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've got anything else say so i think should we just get on to ratings yeah give this in using the same scale that the uh the original book club used out of 10 yes. I, mean, I think i would give this one a solid eight out of 10 which in the 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 american school system would be a a b effort 80 80 <laughs> percent um yeah. it it added to the to the mythos of the time war it, it gave me a lot of insight i thought into the doctor's character and and mindset and it you know kind of served as a almost like a tragic prequel i think to you know one of my favorite stories of all time the the 50th anniversary special yeah. and it did it in a way with with you know that didn't change or alter my my thoughts about the time war so it, it had a delicate line to walk and i think he did a really good job with it i, I would think like a nine or a ten would be something that just really is almost genre transcending sort of yeah. it's something that would work on its own not as a Doctor Who concept, but a, you know, just as a science fiction concept, I think you know that something like that would be like a ten for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, g- I give this one like a, a solid eight. How about yeah. yourself? Uh, for me, I think it's it's a seven. Um, you know, I, I did enjoy it. Uh, I I did kind of because there wasn't any special kind of like sort of depth or things because like we 
do because we, we have flashes of kind of like Cinder's past. And we occasionally have uh, sort of Cinder kind of thinking, "Oh, it's jolly good that the doctors come along, and it means that I've been, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've not been making as much of a difference, but I will now." It, it, you know, her characterization isn't quite as deep as I'd hoped, but maybe I'm being unfair because this is a story not really about her as much as it, you know, it is about telling, you know, these kind of latter stages of time war. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll stick with a seven. Yeah, I mean, I mean, seven is a that's a decent rating too so, yeah 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 that's yeah. uh i am i'm glad i read it at uh yeah and that's yeah. that's that's what counts um at this point in the podcast we normally read any listener mail or feedback or yeah. tweets that we get uh this being our first episode we don't really have any of that yet but if you do want to get in touch with us mm-hmm. you can send us an email at a n d w b c podcast at gmail.com or you can uh send us a tweet or follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC podcast uh, on Twitter. And uh, you can also leave feedback on our Libsyn page or now that we're on iTunes, you can leave us an iTunes review. Every podcast says that it helps. So it must help. It must so help. You, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it helps the algorithm in some strange way. Yeah. Uh, so, so please, please do that. Before we get to <laughs> announcing what our, book selection is for next month i did want to mention too that something that we didn't talk about in episode zero that we put out kind of our introduction episode there are two book selections that were chosen Mm -hmm. by the uh original doctor who book club podcast but they had never completed um originally for episode 58 so the christmas episode last year they were going to uh review christmas on a rational planet but that was replaced with uh the last resort we're thinking way, way ahead, you know, for December, we might want to do Christmas on a Rational Planet so we can get that one reviewed. Yeah. And then so the, start saving up for the reprint now, folks. Yeah, hopefully it'll be on, a, <laughs> on a ebook in some form at that point. Sure. And then the other one we're going to get to is uh, St. Anthony's Fire, which has mm-hmm. the Doctor and Benny in it. And that was chosen as the final book selection in episode 60. Mm-hmm. So we'll hopefully get to that one this year as well. Mm-hmm. And a Mark Gattis one. Mm-hmm. So do you want to go ahead and announce our book selection for April? What we were wanting to do is, because Capaldi's back for one last season, alas, uh, we want to do a 12th Doctor book. So we were having kind of like a rummage around the uh, the 12th Doctor novels and, and thought that it would be kind of cool to do a Big Bang Generation, uh, which is a Gary Russell book uh, featuring Benny Summerfield, uh, who was a companion to the Seventh Doctor and briefly the Eighth Doctor from the um, from the Virgin books. So that sentence could be could be used in more than one. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And uh, yeah, so we're going to do Big Bang Generation by Gary Russell. Gary's going to be a guest at a local convention here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, in at the end of May called Council Room. It'll be nice too that I'll be able to say hey i've I've actually read your latest <laughs> contribution to the to yes. the doctor who universe so yeah. very much looking forward to that and i'm hoping too that he makes some sort of contrast or distinction or hopefully that river song gets a mention at some point because the two characters uh started out there were a lot of kind of superficial comparisons between benny and river and that they were both archaeologists who knew the doctor and had a past with him but um yeah. they the two characters have d- diverged so much uh since mm-hmm. since then but it'll be interesting to see if she warrants a mention or not so that's what i'm gonna yes. be yeah. keeping my eye out for i've enjoyed um uh, sort of you know quite a few of gary's books and sort of particularly scales of injustice um uh, that i seem to remember didn't go down so well with the earlier version of this podcast i might be wrong but uh, yeah it would be it would be very interesting to see uh, sort of how how the two um, um sort of encounter each other and, and you know how they get on i was gonna say i mean she's she's used to traveling with a cantankerous scottish doctor uh, so uh, yeah it'll be <laughs> yeah good to see I, I, I don't know that i've read a whole lot of gary russell's other mm. work i've read uh, Legacy, which I think was a Seventh Doctor Ice Warriors. Yes, it was. It was. No yes. And then I, I also read Invasion of the Cat People, which was covered on the previous yes. podcast. Yes, so, yeah. yes. I'm looking forward to it. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. And so we'll, we'll hope to have that out in, uh, in, in, in April time. Right around the time that uh, 
Capaldi comes back to our screens, I think. Yes, yes. Well, well he kind of came back to our screens uh, last night because uh, the trailer was uh, for the new season was aired last night. I saw That's, that. It was... A trailer, yes. So uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Exciting stuff. Yes, it's, indeed. It's, it's been it's been a it's been over a year, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes it better be good but uh, I, I do very much kind of in, enjoy Moffat's take so uh, he'll be likewise yes. all right well oh. un- until next month I've been mm-hmm. Matt in Minnesota I'm Chris in South London happy reading folks bye bye thank you for listening to the all new adventures of the Doctor Who book club podcast you can contact the show and follow us on twitter at andwbc podcast Our music is the Doctor Who theme, swing jazz version by George C. Music, used with attribution under Creative Commons license. Until next month, happy reading.